this is it. I think, is this microphone on? Does this camera work? <laughs> nice. This is, this is the, the Weird Trick Mafia, isn't it? Yeah, it's our first episode. <laughs> this, should be a, this should be a good ride. We'll see how this goes. I am Andrew Clay Schaefer, uh, AKA Little Idea on Twitter, and my partner in crime. I'm Jess Fraz on Twitter, uh, Jesse Frizzell in real life. <laughs> So, what's going on today? Is there anything uh, interesting to talk about? Um, well, there's this uh, Linux Foundation uh, Leadership Summit uh, that, you know, I guess I have opinions on, <laughs> mostly because of uh, their lack of impact uh, doing things for actual projects that I seem to care about that are like uh, the underlying infrastructure of the internet and things like that, like Bash or open SSL or just even small projects made by people. So, so what's the thing that you, cause uh, you posted a few things on Twitter, right? And, and you have kind of opinions and, and I'd like to like, let's explore what those opinions are. So I also have opinions, but, but you already probably kind of got people stirred up on the internet. So like, what do you think the Linux foundation could or should do that it's not doing? So, um, well, one, I feel like this is just a terrible look that they are hosting this uh, and they, they continue to host these events at like very like boozy hotels. You know, you have like this one's at the Ritz Carlton and then they have all these like kind of activities that they do throughout the day, which is like really cool as maybe like a company offsite or something. But for a like foundation that is trying to be like a. So, uh, so right now it's more about what they it, it's less about what they could do and you don't like what they are doing. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so what they could do no, well, is... We could keep finishing that thought. So you, you don't like that they're having a party, basically, at uh, Ritz-Carlton. Yeah, because it's uh, really just like kind of in your face versus uh, being more modest and actually just like focusing on the impact that they have. But like they don't have impact, so I guess they can't focus on that. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what I'd love like to actually see happen is almost something more of like the Google Summer of Code model, where like contributors uh, come to a project and they get like an internship, and then uh, they get paid for the work that they do, and then the project like gets to like choose work that they get done. So it's kind of like this mutual like. So, so let's define impact because I think that there's a, a counterpoint where when you look at what. I mean, there's a bunch of things we could we could critique and analyze here. So Linux Foundation is one thing, but then the Linux Foundation spawns all these kind of sub foundations. Oh yeah. And and I think at least for you know visibility's sake, that there's things that are happening in kind of this cloud native computing foundation that are impactful. But you're are you saying that the, the foundation doesn't help that or it does or Cause that's sort of different than what you're talking, what you're saying. So I'm, I'm curious, like, where are you, what, like, how let's define impact. So we have a shared lexicon. Yeah. So there, uh, impact to me is like, a. I mean, I guess it would be like things that I value being seen throughout the foundation. It would be like, then I would be like, Oh, they have impact because they are obviously like helping things that I value, which would be like, um, you know, doing the right thing helping projects, um, helping people, like uh, growing people, growing projects. They do a really good job of marketing projects, like I'll give them that, but they don't do a good job of actually supporting the projects in their growth. Um, like I know at least from some of the maintainers that I've talked to, like the projects in the Linux Foundation, like they have a hard time getting money for things that they need them for and like setting up infrastructure and stuff like that. But then there's the whole problem with like projects that are outside the scope of the Linux Foundation that actual like dependencies of Linux Foundation projects like rely on. So like Bash, I mean, it has one maintainer and so it's there's, really- There's yeah. definitely like a haves, haves not divide in what people are calling open source. And open source, I mean, this could be, it's like easily like another two hour discussion well, open source is not well defined either. When people talk about this word, they say this thing like it's actually a thing. It's actually not a thing. It, it, it's like so many things. It's different to every person you talk to. And and having a shared definition of open source is, is not a solved problem. 
Yeah, that's true. Because I feel like their open source is not the same as my open source, like for sure. Like it's, it's very visible. So, so on this kind of haves, have not divide, the things that you value, like what you're calling impact is really the, the support for really code, like level contribution and, and not the kind of big party, you know, you use the word boozy um, get togethers. Yeah, I mean, code or like documentation or like anything that really supports the project, like infrastructure, um, it doesn't have to be necessarily code. Like even if you are uh, like helping out growing the community and doing stuff like that, like that counts as well. It's just. Um, so so I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to understand the, cause I feel like the Linux foundation, while they're definitely, you know, deserving of some criticism, probably they do, they do this stuff that probably helps some with the marketing, which probably helps some with the community. Well, like having an exclusive event that not everyone is invited to, like really isn't helping the community. That's, that's, that's fair. Although the, they did call it the leadership summit. So like it was, it was kind of defined to be, you know, for, for just to try to like play fair and nice. Um, it was sort of it's defined fair. to be like a little bit of a, of an elite uh, invitation only setup, right? Yeah, yeah, it just comes off as, it comes off wrong. It's almost like the branding of it is wrong, you know? Um, it's, it's like Davos people getting together to talk about <laughs> not being taxed. Yeah, and, and no, it really is. It's like the elite. philanthropy is. Um, and I think that like maybe if they focused more on like using that time instead of using that time like doing like the whole like glass blowing activities or like rafting or like I can't remember what else was on the list. Um, if they use that time to then like try to, you know, get everyone in a room and actually like do something impactful, that would be great. But instead, like they're doing other things. So again, like there's probably some of it that's a bit over self congratulatory, but having been, you know, through whatever I've been through, there is definitely like some value to experiencing things with other human beings. And, and it doesn't always have to be like, oh, let's like do work now, right? Like the work is actually growing relationships in, in that context. So I'm, I'm trying to, you know, balance a little bit because there's certainly things that uh, I've seen foundations do that I didn't love. But like, I also think that it's not wrong for people to kind of get together and, and like do things that aren't like totally business all the time, right? Like business is facilitated by some of this like social lubrication too. Yeah, I mean, I totally get that. I mean, and like, actually like one of the things I was thinking of like, is that like, I wouldn't mind if I saw like the singular bash maintainer like using foundation money to go to Hawaii, right? Like that would be great if like they all got together and had a thing there and then they went white water rafting. But it's the disparity between the two that so is just so wrong. Okay, so it would be better in your in your mental model of what impact is for open source if they invited the bash maintainer to go whitewater rafting at the Ritz Carlton. Like that, yeah, or like all of them, like get all of them, <laughs> not just bash. No, no, like yeah, all of them. So, yeah. So so then, some of the indictment is that the the people that are benefiting from the money that flows into some of the foundations. Their, their value is in sort of like perpetuating the foundations and not necessarily in kind of creating all this other value that, that we, we value, like we, we believe open source about. Because I think it's worth talking about that for a minute. So, so when we talk about open source, because I've seen some of this in your, in your Twitter feed, and I think it's worth like putting out there explicitly with people. It's like, it's like, there's like this low level developer sharing and, and developer mentoring and, and developing people and some of the stuff that you, that you mentioned that is, is magical, right? Like, and when you experience that, like you kind of want to do it. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and you get a benefit from it and you also get a benefit of other people. And then there's an, another side, a dark side, which, which I think um, I've experienced and I'm sure you have as well, where like all of a sudden you've got some open source code and, and now, all of a sudden, like everyone expects you to 
basically do work for them to like make that open source code work for them. You know, yeah, if, yeah. And, and that sucks or can't. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's like that's a huge dark side, like for sure. But then like uh, there's also the dark side of like um, where it almost seems like corporations are profiting more off this software than like the lowly maintainer uh, that doesn't necessarily like get the outcome of it. Absolutely. So there's a whole bunch of themes here, right? That, that we've seen basically play out over the last few months. So you have a bunch of people, a bunch of projects, um, some of them, my friends that have relicensed aspects of their, of their code. Um, feeling feeling uh, whatever kind of threats from some of the other dynamics in the market. Uh, yesterday, Amazon announced a distribution for Elasticsearch, and then and then something else that sort of feeds into that is uh, this Nginx thing, um, Nginx blah blah by F5, and and all these things together. Like there's the code, and then there's kind of this this work that gets done and has to happen for that code to exist, and then there's like money. Right. And, and figuring out how to create value with code doesn't always translate into capturing value with money. Right. And, yeah. and, and if, if you haven't and, and, and for most, most of the cases, like if you're focused on capturing value with money, like you actually capture more, um, maybe then you create it. Yeah, that. That totally makes sense. So, so maybe like, is there some dynamic there that you want, that you like observe or comment on based on, you know, kind of, cause you've touched a lot of these projects. You've like been part of a bunch of these kind of conversations and companies and you know, whatever, like I'm sure you've seen a lot of this. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because um, like from the maintainer standpoint, you just see the fire hose of like stuff coming into the project. And so you almost have to prioritize like what's getting commented on the most, like who's the person like filing the issue? Like, is it coming from like Spotify or something like that? Um, and then it's like uh, on the more business side, uh, like they, they actually go to the customers and have like customer visits and talk to them. And then they, they hear their problems. So, and sometimes like those problems aren't necessarily like passed down from what I've seen to the project or it is done in a way that is almost like contrived and maybe like the person who is the middleman like doesn't always necessarily understand the problem. So then it gets like misinterpreted. It's whispered out uh, the way. Yeah. So I, I think it's just, it's interesting to see like the way that that works like at that scale because there are like a lot of companies using projects that I've worked on. And I wasn't aware of like most of the problems until I actually like entered a big company. And then every time that people would explain the problems to me, I was like, I don't, you're saying words, but like, I don't think that you know what they mean. Um, so it was hard to actually get to a like real communication path on what the real problem was, but then you get there eventually. But it is like, there is a, there's a like lack of communication, I think. So, so everything you said is certainly true and something I've witnessed or experienced firsthand, but nothing you said actually results in people paying you, right? No, that's true. Like, like there, there has to be this other side of this because I like, I like eating and kind of like being able to live in a house, right? So like at some point, someone has to say with a straight face that, that you should give me money for something. Right. Yeah. And, and I have a lot of friends that are, you know, relatively intelligent by all measures that have, for whatever reason, not connected this, this kind of notion. And it doesn't just have to do with open source, it has to do with technology and technologists where like for, on one hand, they, they don't want to do this kind of salesy thing. And then on the other hand, they, they somewhat don't understand the true value of what they've created. And so they're not willing to value it at, at what someone might be willing to pay them. And, and so those two things together made a lot of people that I know that were very focused on technical excellence, um, kind of bitter after the fact when something they created 
resulted in literally millions, if not more, um, dollars for other people and, and like very little for themselves. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think like there is that definitely, like I've seen that in people where they don't see the value in it. So they don't ask for things necessarily. Um, but I've also seen it for go money. to extremes for where like- ask for money. Yeah. But I've also seen it go to extremes where like the people then become these like egotistical nightmares because they were the person who did that. Also true. So I don't know if there's like a middle ground in there. There might not be, honestly. <laughs> uh, I, I think that there's a new possibility to kind of like reimagine some of this that happens in the future that is the, the groundwork is laid by the fact that you have open source, that you have GitHub, that you have Twitter, that you have these conversations. But for the most part, uh, the golden age of IT sort of software companies has been predicated on this archetype you just mentioned, um, where, where you basically have people whose only job is to manage that relationship and ask for like the most possible amount of money and, and get paid like a lot of money to do that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I just feel like no one's doing that for Bash. <laughs> Yet everyone uses it. And that's like my, always my example, just because it's like something that is so like prevalent. But this also, this also relates to this question and, and, and this observation about people who are relicensing because the way that Bash is released and the way that it's consumed, it makes it, it makes it hard for you to go back and then capture value. Like what, what's the path for Bash right now today to go capture value, right? Like, well, let's say all of a sudden you woke up and you said, okay, my, my strategic play of the day, my chess game to play, my puzzle to solve is how do I fund Bash by capturing value relative to the value created? And, and I don't think there's a straightforward way for you to go, basically like you're, you're imposing a Bash tax, right? That, like that's sort of what you wanna do. Yeah, but that is totally hard, like short of selling out to a vendor, like there's no, and then just supporting Bash for that one vendor, I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying I have an answer. I'm just saying it's like, like a hard problem and it's especially hard when you go, when you go after the fact, right? So that's what I think a lot of these um, conversations where people are upset about someone relicensing is because the new license is restricting freedoms that were already given in, in some kind of strategic hope that you can capture value or take away the way that someone else is capturing value. Does that make sense? And, and so like no one, no one would ever be upset if you release a commercial product and like sold it for all the money in the universe. Cause it's like very clear, like what that contract is. I'm selling you this for that. But when you give someone freedom and then you take it back, like everyone gets mad. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. That's why, I mean, I'm, I, I'm never actually one of those people that like get super mad about the licensing because I'm more like a pay the maintainers. I mean, I guess that's my hill, but like, uh, but you have it, to figure out a structural way to do that. It's, it's not enough to just say pay the maintainers. Like how, you know, right now we kind of got fixated on bash, but there's a bunch of these other projects and we could probably list a couple dozen where, where, the same kind of dynamics apply and what would it take to to support them at the level that jess feels is adding impact and value like right? creating impact and value yeah that's true well like what about elastic with the aws thing like uh is that good or bad i haven't really looked into it i mean i don't think good and bad is the right words to think about it right so so what you have here is an open source project that is is building a ecosystem and released under a certain license and they've they've also then kind of crossed the streams a bit with this open core model and they're putting these these proprietary things that they're charging money for on top of that of that core and and kind of harvesting value from that ecosystem and then you have amazon who you know for first 
you know, whatever kind of intents and purposes is the 800 pound cloud gorilla and probably better at operationalizing uh, things better than almost anyone. Maybe there's a, a short list of people that could even be in the conversation. And, and they've decided to operationalize, um, you know, Elasticsearch, right? And so then now if you're that on the other side of that equation, not only did they operationalize it, but now they've released a open version of a bunch of things that the, that the company behind Elasticsearch was monetizing, right? So that's, yeah. that's an existential kind of business critical thing to, to sort out. And I'm not saying like it's good or bad for any one party. It's like, this is the rules of the game. Like you release code with this license and you give people this freedom and then they exercise it. You can't be, you can't be mad at them or, or, or I mean, maybe you can be mad at them, but it's, they didn't, they didn't do anything that wasn't a freedom that was explicitly granted by the license that that code was in. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm here to say it's good or bad. I mean, there's certainly been no shortage of uh, opinion and discussion about it um, on both sides. Um, but I just think you have to understand when you make choices about these, these things, licensing, how you're going to capture value that you're not necessarily, you're not necessarily guaranteed your business model. Right. And the, and the game can change out from underneath you. And sometimes that is, you know, unfair, but like, that's the, that's the life that we, like in, in, until we're ready to get rid of capitalism and like markets and like, that's how we're going to live. That's the, that's the rules of the game. Yeah. It's just unfortunate that like, I don't know. I just hate the, the, the difference between those who like are, are on the side of making a lot. And that's, I mean, good for them. Like some of them I actually really like, and I'm glad to see when like, uh, they monetize open source, but then there's like the flip side of the ones that don't realize their worth. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have all those friends, right? I just mentioned that same, same yeah. where people that created, you know, literally outsized value for other people got very, very little for, for their work, you know, intellectual work and, and, and emotional work to create and maintain some of those projects. And some of them are quite bitter actually, but we'll, we won't name names. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. I, what, what, uh, I don't know if that's my network of yours, but that was kind of a, you sound like a Cylon for a second. The old style Cylons. Nice. So with that, we're, uh, I don't know, is there, is there more points about foundations? I, I feel like foundations at the level of the, of the dollar amounts, they're being kind of tossed around there's some kind of necessary evil to allow collaboration between what, what are potentially antagonistic players in, in the space. But then there's probably some things they could do to reflect on how they create and capture value and how they impact some of these projects and ecosystems that would, that would be net win for everyone. Like no one has to lose. Like if you have, this kind of this kind of money flowing through those foundations, and there's probably ways to re repurpose some of the the resources in a way that would make Jess happy. Yeah, I mean, they could definitely just hire someone to make me happy, and uh, I feel like they have the funds to do that. Like they have a ton of money, so they could definitely hire someone. I mean, hire like I don't think it's hiring one person, right? I think there's like more systemic. Um, some of, some of it's probably just about mindset, but, but it's, it's also kind of like programs, programmatically. I mean, I like the suggestion of the summer of code, you know, these sort of things that build, build on themselves over time. It's not an event that you hired this one person or this other person. And, and then, yeah, uh, yeah. but it's like, what are the systemic things that do um, build the value over time to, to, I, I, I think from your perspective and don't, don't let me put words in your mouth, like you are on the side of the maintainer, right? Like you, you fight for that kind of like maintainer, um, having, having like whatever empathy and experience on, on that side of it. 
totally yeah and and like now having seen the other side of it where like people make a ton and then they become like either very egotistical or I still enjoy them as a person um so it, I I just feel like there should be a bridge to help the others get there so so the bridge is is cash or the, what, what does the bridge mean or I mean the bridge could be like the programs that they put in place if they like come up with them or cash flow like I know like github is actually like working on like open source sustainability things to kind of help projects and stuff like that like it's a hard problem to solve though so I don't know I, mean, I, I think this is the interesting thing not just about open source but really about the way that kind of capitalism tends to accumulate value and, and, and accumulate cash right so you have this haves have not divide and you know it's one thing to say okay like what is it what does it take for a maintainer to to live a nice lifestyle and then and then what happens when i mean i think the number for nginx was uh 600 something million so like when you have 600 something million flow into you know x number of pockets divided by x where x is like not all people on the planet then like that starts to be a lot of money right and the t types yes. of things that you could do with that kind of money are, are kind of fundamentally different than, than like just pay your bills yeah that's like a huge discrepancy um and that happens a lot like there's a lot of open source acquisitions like that uh so so here's a little sub theme to develop that that what you just said i, I thought about this a bit before but there's there's kind of like this weird sort of false signal assumption that got set up in open source because of stuff that happened in the past where now the preponderance of projects that we see, not necessarily because we see them because they're visible, but because they can actually literally market are VC funded, right? And, and, and when you take funding, you know, on the order of millions of dollars, if not tens or maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars for funding. Now there's, there's another party that has some expectation that you're going to return that capital. Right. And they, they start to put pressure onto the decision-making and, and that drives a bunch of these behaviors. Right. And, and I know you've been part of some of these um, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me that the VCs are now interested in open source projects because it almost, it, it started from a place of being kind of like very small and now like almost everyone is trying to monetize open source. So it's certainly true on the infrastructure side and it's been true for a while, you know, and, and you know, Puppet that I was involved in, uh, we raised venture capital in 2009 ish. So that's like 10 years ago. So, so there's always been, and before that you have these stories, you know, my sequel was the story everyone held up for a long time. Um, pour one out for Sun Microsystems. And then you have the other thing that everyone always wanted to be the, the, the Red Hat of X. So Red Hat's kind of held up uh, as this thing. But if you look at the historical context that those, those exits happen in, like those, those circumstances are very different than what you have today. You cannot do that thing that they did the same way. So we're kind of like just fumbling as we go forward, trying to figure out how to do this. Like there's not a right way. And whenever someone tries to follow the kind of formulaic paint by the numbers, like, you know, there, there's, there's certainly exits, right? Like a lot of things you could point to. Elastic is one of them. They, they IPO'd their company. Um, it's valued. Uh, like I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to look it up as something like, five, six billion dollars, billion with a B, right? Like that's real money. And those, those investors got paid to, you know, that's pretty good return. I, I didn't go do all the math for the cap table, but seems like that's pretty good return for, for millions to get billions. And then, yeah. and then that just makes it so like now that's a pattern that they're going to, they're going to put more chips on the table to do that again. Right. Like that's, that's the, that's the game. <laughs> Yeah, I just don't know if it can always be replicated. I mean, like, like I'm arguing. In fact, it can never be. Like each one. Of oh, okay, these, yeah. Each one. I of mean, it's kind of its own unique circumstance and snowflake. And and you know, I had this argument, and there's there's other people trying to make kind of like open source business model arguments, and there's an open source venture fund focus and that kind of thing. But 
in reality, like I feel like there's no, like monetizing open source is not actually a thing. Open source is not a business model. Like basically all these exits that you can point to for, the, for, for all of them, you know, even Red Hat, because they changed their model after the fact, they, they monetized selling proprietary code. So there's like yeah. a different core model for almost all of the, or, or like the olden days, the dual licensing stuff, right? All that changed though now in the world where you have these cloud providers who can operationalize these things as a service probably more effectively than you can just by virtue of their resources and, and their experiences obviously too. But, but the, the fact that they can print money and they already run these massive infrastructures makes trivializing or, or makes um, operationalizing one more quote unquote as a service offer like almost trivial. Yeah, that's true. They just hire a team and then they, you know, deploy it on their infrastructure. Like I've seen it done. It's crazy. It's a little scary sometimes the way that they slap it together, but like it's, it's doable quickly. Well, it's not just about quick. It's about, it's also about driving down the operational burden. I mean, I think that's one of the advantages that the, the big cloud players have. And, and this is all of the cloud players at this point, you know, the big three at least have massive, distributed system, infrastructure experience, just from running all these other things before, right? So, so to add like one more little thing, and, and then they also, this is where it gets kind of interesting watching some of the, the discussions around contribution. So they can go based on their operational experience, look at the architecture and look at the kind of cascading failures from a statistical perspective and start to fix some of these things. But then, this is, this is where it gets interesting and like dovetails into this maintainer conversation. Like a lot of these, a lot of these companies or these VC backed uh, open source projects, they don't really want more code. They don't really want contribution, at least from a code level. Like doesn't, it doesn't help their, it doesn't align with their interests, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's yeah. the thing. That totally makes sense. I mean, like the companies that prioritize the community and stuff like that, like they're not prioritizing business. Like I've worked at them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it is a difference in kind of what they, what they value. <laughs> but, th but then, I mean, some of those stories aren't over, right. And some of that story is yet to be written, but I, I personally, I love building communities. I love being part of a community. I feel you know, quote unquote, the, 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 the act of being communal is what creates the community. Like you have to act communally if you want to get communities. And a lot of times yeah. people, people use this word community, community, and really that's not what they mean. They, they mean basically like people that are using this code is somehow part of the community. And that's not really not communal. At least. Yeah, I actually think maybe that's like something that I, I, I dislike about the Linux Foundation because I see like a lot of rivalries between the competitors and like they like to think that there isn't anything there, but there is like on the sides of each, each kind of company that there's like a whole different story almost. But in some ways, isn't that an argument for the Linux Foundation? Like how do you resolve those in, in a way without that, that in the middle? That's true. I mean, like they would not be resolved without the Linux Foundation, but I do think that it's like this fake community feeling thing, like where everyone then goes home to their separate mafias afterwards. Uh, after, you know, like doing the nice, like, let's drink wine together. <laughs> mafias without um, as many weird tricks as we have. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, I, I think that this is, on some level though, a benefit though, right? And, and like allow certain things, maybe, maybe that cash doesn't get deployed um, as impactfully as it could be from your perspective, but without, without that kind of central, um, whatever, neutral party, then, then some of that stuff would be impossible and maybe it doesn't resolve conflicts, maybe it just sublimates them, but it, at least it gives you a, a sort of shared table and setting where it does facilitate some of this collaboration. Totally, totally. I just wish that there was like more, like uh, I guess like collaborate to help others then, 
um, get to where you are versus like just being like, we're all here. So let's discuss whatever is the topic of the day, like the new foundation. I mean, and, and that's also related to this going back to like how cash flows. A lot of those companies have a business that exists independent of their involvement with the foundations. Right. And so they're kind of, they're, they're, they're like able, I mean, this is where it gets a little weird because it's like the, it becomes a, a maybe like less than virtuous cycle because it behooves them to pay to play and it behooves the, the foundation to like take the money. Right. And so then yeah. maybe, maybe there's a way to, <clears throat> from, from a platonic, you know, ideal sense, like get a, an enlightened uh, dictator to fix that problem. But as long as, as long as it's sort of cash focus, I'm not sure there's a good way to get out of it. Yeah, that totally makes sense. They would need a new person, like just, you know, uh, because all the, all the kind of EDs for these things, like the executive directors, it, it's not doing anything. Like no one's really pushing the line, but like, that's because they've continually done the same thing time after time. So like, there's no, there's no one who would break the status quo and take the job there and then be like, you know what, we're going to do it different, but still take all the money. <laughs> well, okay. So this is probably like one nice point to explore and then, and then we'll call it a day and we can rant about something else next time. But the, so, so if you were made the ED of a, of a new foundation, so it's the Jess Rizal foundation, what would you do? Well, um, first I'd like what, actually- What would breaking the mold look like? Um, well, like you'd have to listen to the actual maintainers of these projects that are not being like sustained well. So like I'd go like actually listen to them and their problems because right now I'm just like, you know, just thinking about like what their problems are. Like I'm not sure. Um, like I know based off my experience, but they probably have different problems. So after like then listening to all the maintainers and kind of collecting all the like, woes that they're going through like i try to use that money to solve it and if it's giving the money directly to the maintainers which i would i think like at some scale that is what it is or it's like creating programs then you hire the people to create the programs and you create the programs like uh just like listen to them and then solve their problems right now it's just like i am screaming into the void at the linux foundation and they just are like we wish just would just shut up um, and get out of our way so we can continue just, you know, raking in money. Um, so I don't know. I think it has to do a lot with listening to people and then solving their problems. Like, so I, I like that answer, but just to kind of go back to the framing about the, the flow of value, like there's, there's certainly things you could do with money and, and then you could, you know, pay people and that that's, that's one way to frame it. But when you look at some of these foundations, the, the members and, and some of those projects and those maintainers, they aspire to make money too, right? So, so I think that there's probably some opportunity to figure out ways to facilitate those, those maintainers sustaining themselves more effectively. So it's not just about taking money, flowing it through the foundation and, and distributing it to the, to the maintainers so much. And this is just me like throwing stuff out there. Uh, but there's probably some opportunity to think, think about, okay, maintainer, here's how you clearly create value. Is there some way that we could help you frame, think about, and capture value more effectively? In, in addition to maybe like paying you a little bit or whatever, right? Like, I don't know. I think that, that seems like a more holistic, systemic way to, to try to add value and, and impact. Yeah, it's like teaching the man to fish or whatever. I just feel like, in my opinion, there's only two ways to go about that. It's like, one, joining a vendor company that sells your software or becoming a consultant. And like, only one, do you get freedom and neutrality? I mean, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose, I think. The, yes. The famous <laughs> one, right? Uh, yeah, I... I mean, I, I guess if you're optimizing for freedom, then then maybe your eyes poor is like the downside. That's, I mean, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I, That's true. I, just, just, just saying. Not, not to uh, get to uh, cliche or, or you know, like classic, uh, classic rock here, but that's a uh, that's one way to think about. It. Anyway. 
if you have any uh, kind of parting words of wisdom, we, we said we were going to try to target like a 40 minute and we're coming up on 40 minutes. So just in the, in the formal like hygiene of our podcast, I think we should uh, give people one last thing and then we'll, we'll call this an episode and, and look forward to the next one. Nice. Um, yeah, I guess like some problems are impossible to solve. <laughs> I believe some problems are quite impossible or, or they're non-unique um, and, and quite convoluted. And now I want to add one more thing that, you know, we're, we're calling this the weird trick mafia. And right now it's me and you and like we have weird tricks. But one day we aspire to have more people in the mafia with weird tricks as well. Totally. So, so if you if you have interesting things you want to talk about, hit us up on on the Twitters. Cool deal. Till next time. Yeah. All right, I'm going to push the little stop button. That's that's episode <laughs> one. Stop.